our nice simple story so far about the LU factorization leaves out one little problem, which is that it doesn't always work in the way that we've looked at it. It's not hard to find an example of this. So here is a trivial linear system in two variables. I think you'd agree that it has a solution. If we write this, the matrix of this linear system, then we get 0, 1, 1, 0 as our matrix A. Now, suppose we were to proceed with our LU factorization algorithm. So the first row of A tells us the first row of U. And then the first column of A is supposed to tell us the first column of L. But we can't use it because there is a 0 multiplying L1 here on the left. Now that's called the pivot element. It came from the diagonal, the KK position of the matrix AK. So here we had K equals 1. Now there's a simple fix for this, and it's one that you already learned when you learned Gaussian elimination, which is that we're going to allow row swaps. After all, that, all that does is change the order of the equations that can't change the solution. Now the way this looks in the standard derivation you can see in the book. The effect that it has on the outer product form is also interesting and in some ways may be easier to follow. It's actually one of the more complicated things that we'll do this semester. What we're going to do is instead of having our unit lower triangular L, we're going to pick a new structure. We're going to say there's some row I1 where the first column of L has a 1 and all the other columns are 0 in that row. And before, what we had was that I1 is just 1. So the 1, 1 entry was 1, and the rest of that row was 0. But with this more general form, we'll look at the I1 row of our matrix A1. And we'll do the usual thing by moving that vector inside the outer product sum. And then with that property that we just stated, it turns out that in row I1, only k equals 1 matters. Otherwise, you get a 0. And so that effectively gives us 1 and sets k equal to 1. So the whole thing is just U1 transpose. In other words, that's our first row of U again. So it just comes from a different row of A1. So now we have the first row of U. And if we look at the first column of A1, then everything happens just like before. We didn't change the structure of U at all. So this sum collapses down to just U11 times L1. Now this U11, this pivot element, is what caused all the trouble before. But now we're able to guarantee that that pivot is non-zero. Assuming that we can find a row I1 where the matrix A is non-zero in column 1, we'll be able to choose a non-zero pivot. If that's not the case, then that whole first column must be 0, in which case A is a singular matrix. So now we're ready to move to the next thing. And this is exactly like it was before. We subtract off that first outer product we just found. And if you go through the work, you'll show that this is now 0 in a row and a column. But it's the I1 row and the first column. Before, it was the first row and the first column. Now we're ready to continue inductively, so to speak. So we look in that second column. We want to find a row I2 where the matrix is non-zero in that column. If that isn't possible, it means the matrix is singular. And now our requirement on L is extended to say that in row I2, 
we have a 1 in column 2 and a 0 in all the columns to the right of that. So that sets us up so that if we look in row I2 of our current matrix, we get the second row of U. And then if we look in column 2, we get the second column of L, and so on. So it's very much like before, except that we've generalized the structure of L a bit. So at the end of this process, we've picked out n rows, and they're all different. So it's a permutation of rows 1 to n. And if we look at the jth number in the permutation, if we look at the jth row that we're picking out, then L is 1 in column J and 0 in all the columns to the right of J. When you tease this all out, what you find is that the structure we have for L is a row shuffled unit lower triangular matrix. Take a unit lower triangular matrix and change the order of its rows. In the abstract, row pivoting looks pretty complicated, but in practice, it's going to be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Uh, here is a system. It's equivalent to the system I did in the previous MATLAB example, except that the row order was changed. And if we try to do straight up LU factorization on this, it's actually going to fail. So uh, we set up L and U as we did before to be four by four matrices. And now if we look at A, if we look in the first column, well, actually all of these are non-zero. We could use any of them as pivots, but I'm going to just always pick the largest available pivot in absolute value. Uh, we'll get into the reasons for that later. So in that case, it's the one here in row four is the largest one in column one. So that means that I'm going to select I1 to be equal to four. Okay, and then the first row of U comes from that row of A, row I1. And then the first column of L is done exactly as it was before. Okay, so you see the structure of L, you have a one here and you have zeros in the rest of these columns and that they're gonna stay. All right, and then we define L2 by subtracting off that first outer product. And now you see we still create a column of zeros and a row of zeros, but it's no longer the first row. It's row I1, which was row four, um, that gets zeroed out. Now we're ready for the next step. So we look at our possible pivots. Well, we don't want to choose row, we can't choose row four anymore because that's been zeroed. And I want to choose the largest one anyway, and that's in row three in column two. So that means I let I2 be equal to three here. And then that tells me where to get the second row of U. And then we get the second column of L from there as well. Okay, and so the structure of L is that there's a one here in this row, and then these zeros will stay forever. And now we continue. So here's a three. In column three, Row two is the largest available pivot. So that tells me that I3 is equal to two. We go as before, we get A4. Um, but the, at that point, there's only one choice left, which is row one. So that follows automatically and we can finish. So at the end, here's the U we get. It's upper triangular and here's the L. Okay, it's not lower triangular. Now we still have that L times U is equal to A. So it's still a factorization. But while L is not lower triangular, psychologically it's very close. Remember I was in the order uh, four, three, two, one. And if we take L, if we take the rows of L in that same order, four, three, two, one, then you see we do get a unit lower triangular matrix back. In fact, this is exactly the kind of factorization MATLAB gives you. So the LU command is built into MATLAB. And if we run it on this matrix, we'll get the exact same thing that our algorithm found uh, with this 
permuted lower triangular L and the upper triangular U. Here's a more algebraic way of saying that we have a row shuffled matrix. We'll define a permutation matrix to be an identity matrix with its rows shuffled or reordered. And then there are two important things to know about these permutation matrices. The first is that if you multiply from the left with P, then you can reshuffle the rows in anything. So it reshuffles in the same way we shuffled the identities rows. The other thing to know is that the inverse of our permutation matrix is the same as its transpose. When we get finished with the process above, we said A is a factor of two matrices. One of them is a row permuted L, and the other is an upper triangular U. If we multiply both sides on the left by Q inverse, we can get rid of it from the right side, but then Q inverse is Q transpose, which is just a different permutation. So that means we could write P times A is L times U, where P is some permutation matrix. One of the things that's interesting is that what this says is if we had perfect knowledge, we could have reordered the rows of A from the very beginning and then just done normal LU. In practice, though, we don't know what the ordering is until we've finished the algorithm. We'll see this factorization sometimes called PLU or P transpose LU. Finally, one can prove a theorem that if A is invertible, then the PLU factorization works and vice versa. So it really is all we need in order to do factorization for linear systems. When we solve systems in floating point, it turns out that pivoting is necessary not just when we have a zero pivot, but whenever we have a small pivot. So here's a two by two linear system that comes uh, straight from the book where it's done algebraically. Here, I'm just gonna do it numerically for this small number epsilon. And the system is set up so that the exact solution is one, one. If we take a look at this matrix, this is an interesting case study in how MATLAB displays results. So by default, to keep things uh, from being, looking overwhelming, MATLAB only shows you about five digits of a number, but there are 16 digits of every number, no matter what it's showing you. So in fact, this number looks like zero here, but it's not really zero. So what I'm gonna do is ask it to show me all the digits of the results. Now we see properly that this 1-1 one, one element, this pivot element, is non-zero. So we can go ahead and do LU factorization without any kind of pivoting. And if I do that using our old function, we get a unit lower triangular L and an upper triangular U. And we can verify that this is a correct factorization. In fact, it's exactly correct here. Now, we want to use this factorization to solve a linear system. Remember that the linear system with an LU factorization is equivalent to two triangular linear systems that we can solve. And we have functions to solve triangular systems, but I'm going to change now and start solving everything with backslash. Backslash in MATLAB is nice in that if you have a triangular system, MATLAB will just skip right ahead to doing the back substitution or forward substitution without attempting to do a factorization first. So I have these two systems. First I solve for Z and then I solve for X and I'm calling it X1 here. And as you can see, the second component is exactly one, but the first component has to be rounded off about here if you wanna get one. So all these digits here are wrong. And you might think, well, there's still a lot of accurate digits. That depends on your perspective. You may go on to do other things that'll cost you more digits in the future. Or if epsilon, the ep number in this example was smaller, I could make the number of lost digits arbitrarily large. So it is a problem. And the point is that we don't have to put up with it if we do pivoting instead. So if I ask MATLAB to do the LU factorization, then it will use pivoting by default. 
And now you see I don't get a lower triangular L, I get a permuted lower triangular. I'd have to flip these rows to get lower triangular. Now fortunately in MATLAB, backslash is also smart enough to know when you have a permuted triangular matrix. So this will do the correct kind of forward substitution here. And now the solution we get is exactly correct. Again, I am asking MATLAB to show me all digits. So all digits of both entries are now correct using pivoting.